Hello boys and girls, welcome to the Ministry of Education and Partners COVID-19 Teaching by Radio program. The Ministry of Education and Partners COVID-19 Teaching by Radio program is a 30 minutes radio intervention support program that is meant to provide continuous instruction to keep you academically engaged during this stay-at-home period, as well as preparing you our 6th, 9th, and 12th graders for the Penny Liberia Primary School Certificate Exam, Liberia Junior High School Certificate Exam, and West Africa Senior Secondary Certificate Exam when the time comes. Also, in addition to this academic support, the program is meant to provide psychosocial support for learners, teachers, and parents, and also tips on how you as parents and teachers can provide support to your students and children at home. Now, let's join our teacher for today's lesson. Welcome to Teaching by Radio. This is a program for COVID-19 sponsored by the Ministry of Education and Partners. And today we'll be doing our lesson in Liberian history with specific emphasis on the administration and contributions of Liberian presidents, seven of them. But today, we'll be discussing only President Charles Dumba Burgess King, who is recorded in history as the 17th president of the Republic of Liberia. King ruled Liberia from 1920 to 1930. And of course, he was from the True Will Party. As we study the administration of President Charles Dumba Bridges King, we want to begin with his own statement at his inaugural, first inaugural address to set the stage. President King said, and I quote, there must be a solidifying of our populations into one compact whole. The various indigenous people must be brought into the body politic, taught the duties and responsibilities of civilized government. Into them, we must infuse or inculcate an appreciative knowledge and understanding of hopes and aspirations of the forefathers who established this nation. There should be no words known in our national vocabulary of speech or even of thought as American Liberians, the countryman, the newcomer, the Sierra Leone man, or such like terms of designating the various elements of our population." Unquote. And so as we begin to study the history and contribution of President King, we want to encourage you as listeners to please find a copy book and notebook and begin to take some notes. Welcome back. The tenure of Charles King as president mark some of Liberia's most historic events. He was a nationalist a reformer and educator. Throughout his administration, he sought to change how the American Liberians governed this country, particularly the way they view the indigenous communities. President King was convicted that before harnessing the nation's meager wealth and inclusion of all citizens, Liberia economy can be revived. Charles Dumba Bridges King was born in Monrovia, March 12, 1871. His father was a West Indian who came to Liberia by way of Sierra Leone. Both his parents were of Creole descent King began his education at Trinity Parish School and the Church Missionary Society Grammar School in Freetown, Sierra Leone. While in Liberia, he enrolled at the Liberia College and studied law. In 1897, he was admitted to the bar and later in 1900, he was appointed prosecuting Anthony for Maserato County. 
In 1890, King's popularity as an educator helped him to concretize his legislative victory. In 1906, he served in the cabinet of President Arthur Buckley as Attorney General, and a few years later, he was selected Secretary of State by President Daniel E. Howard. In 1919, the ruling party, which was the true party, nominated King as the standard bearer to contest the upcoming elections. He meritoriously won the presidency while in Vassalis to sign the treaty that marked the end of World War I. President King was elected three times and served Liberia for 10 years, as I said, from 1920 to 1930. He was determined to use every power within his reach to construct the political and economic reins that littered the country. President King desperately needed capital, that is money, to implement his policy. But Liberia's economy was trending downward at that time. Furthermore, to increase competition in the agricultural sector, especially the production of coffee, Liberia's major export at that time, from Brazil and Europe, and the production of sugar beets, and or had constraints Liberia's ability to generate revenue. So Liberia was producing coffee, but you know coffee and sugar are complementary goods. So the Brazilians were also producing and exporting coffee into other parts of Europe with sugar beets. So that also had an effect on revenue generation in Liberia. You are listening to Teaching by Radio, a program run by the Ministry of Education for COVID-19 with let us continue our discussion on the administration and contributions of President Charles Dunbar Burgess King. The economic condition really drained the government's coffer and even forced Liberia to default on the $5 million loan she had borrowed from Great Britain before the King administration. The government was then pressurized by Great Britain to pay the loan. Within this embarrassment, the King government tried to the US government to negotiate a loan, which was previously proposed during the Howard administration. This request had some support in the US House of Representatives, but lacked the enthusiasm in the Senate, and so the request was denied. Very desperate to find money, President King discovered an unlikely ally in an American firm, Firestone, a tire and rubber company founded by Mr. Harvey Firestone in the 1900s to supply pneumatic tires for wagon, buggies, and other forms of wheeled transportation. The marriage between Firestone and Liberia was viewed as a symbolic relationship. Remember, our country was jammed. There was no way to get money. They went to Great Britain. Great Britain said, no, you owe us some money, you have to pay. So the government turned to America. Why trying to turn to America? They found this friend called Mr. Harvey Firestone, who was looking for a place to plant rubber so that they could produce tires for, for wagons and, and other wheel transportation. So the marriage between Firestone and Liberia was viewed as a symbolic relationship, one in which mutual respect and mutual benefit, benefits was the hallmark. Firestone projected to gain economic edge over its competitors utilizing cheap labor in Liberia while increasing production. As you said, as I was saying before, Firestone had two awesome parts of Latin America, including Brazil. They didn't get land there. But when they came to Liberia, the possibility was there for them to get land to start planting their rubber. So they felt that, hey, once we plant rubber in Liberia, we'll have an advantage over the group in Brazil. At that time, Liberia's tool to reap the benefits of Firestone's success through investment and financial kickbacks. 
Surely and in reality, Liberia needed Firestone to boost its economy. Just as Firestone needed Liberia's cheap labor to stay competitive. Because prior to World War I, the British and Dutch controlled the supply of rubber. Consequently, the U.S. Congress appropriated $500,000 to explore alternative means of augmenting its rubber supplies. Now, before Firestone, there was a rubber company in this country, but it was very small, not as large as Firestone, and it was run by an American also. Firestone seized upon this opportunity and negotiated with the King's administration for establishing a rubber company in Liberia. On November 18, 1926, Liberia agreed to a concession agreement with representatives of Firestone. The first agreement was known as the Mount Barclay Lease, which transferred all properties belonging to the previous company, that is, the previous rubber company that was here and operated here, to Firestone. The second portion of the agreement granted 1 million acres, about 4% of the total landmark of Liberia, to be released by Firestone for 99 years at 5 cents per acre. Class, let me repeat this for your understanding, and I hope you are taking notes. The second portion, and the first portion of the agreement was the first company that was here. The government of Liberia turned that, that company property over to Firestone. So the second portion of the agreement granted Firestone 1 million acres, about 4% of Liberia's total territory, to be leased by Firestone for 99 years at 5% per acre. Furthermore, Firestone agreed to employ 350,000 Liberian workers, as well as construct a port near Monrovia to serve as a hub for transporting the produced litters. Now, in this agreement, in the Firestone agreement, the Liberian government will provide the 99 acres, Firestone will pay 5 cents per acre. And so Firestone will provide the technology, the funds and the technology. So Liberia were providing the land and the labor. So they agree in the agreement that Firestone will employ 350,000 Liberians after taking the, the, the land and lease it for 99 years. The 1 million acre for 99 years, they said they will employ 350,000 Liberians. So Firestone will provide the money and the technology, and the government of Liberia will provide the land and the labor. In addition to that, Firestone agreed to, uh, to construct a port. I guess it was the beginning of the port of Monrovia, or the free port of Monrovia, that will serve as a landing place to, for the transport of the latex that they will produce. Liberia, for its part, agreed to donate rich tropical land to Firestone and provide labor force for the effective operation of the plantation. The terms and conditions of the agreement were unpopular in both the House of Representatives and Senate, in part because it did not benefit Liberia. And so in our House of Representatives and in the House or in the legislature as a whole, they said this agreement was not in the favor of the Liberian people. We gave all that land to Firestone for so many years to come and they paid on five cents per acre. So there was some grumble, there was some dissatisfaction in the legislature. For example, the contract awarded any previous man minerals, diamond, gold, iron ore, etc., discovered on the land to Firestone. You see that problem? After they sold in one, one million acres for 99 years, the agreement say anything that Firestone find on the ground while, while planting the rubber is for Firestone. Whether that was gold, whether that was iron ore, whether that was bauxite or uranium, anything, any mineral that Firestone find there is for Firestone on that farm. That's what the agreement said. It was clear that that particular contract robbed Liberia of its wealth and dignity. But the government was broke and squeezed. 
So due to that fact, the King administration desperately needed finances to begin some of these programs and projects as enumerated by the president. So you see, because the government was broke, so they signed that kangaroo contract. Anything you find on a brand there, 99, notwithstanding, the favorable deal received by Firestone in the agreement, Firestone unilaterally inserted the so-called key clause into the agreement, mandating the government of Liberia to take a $5 million loan from the Finance Corporation of America, a subsidiary of Firestone Rubber Company. Now, let me explain this to you. What do I mean by the K-Clause? The K-Clause is a part of a part and parcel of the second agreement signed by the government of Liberia and Firestone. And in that K-Clause, Firestone said, okay, we will give the Liberian government $5 million. But this $5 million must be borrowed from our own company. I was small barrel company in, in, in that, that, that was by the English subsidiary. And that company was the Final Corporation of America. It's a, fire, it's a small branch of Firestone. That's what I see. So government will borrow $5 million and pay that $500 billion back with interest. That's the kind of help Firestone said they were giving Liberia. There was widespread protest among the people of Monrovia. The K clause was viewed as an illegal addendum to the already signed agreement. But the clause compelled Liberia to repay the loan at an astronomical rate of 7%. You see what I was saying? They signed the agreement already. They took the agreement back to America. They sat down there and changed the agreement and added what they call the K clause. We gave you $5 million, you will take it from our own company. And then when you are ready to pay back or when you're getting ready to pay back, you will pay us 7%. Class, you know what happened? Despite all the protests that were in the streets of Monrovia, the government lobbied for the ratification of the deal because all of the lawyers representing Firestone were Liberian government officials. And I will call some of their names. They included Richard A. Henrys, former President Arthur Buckley, and Senator William V. S. Tottenham. Those are the three gentlemen from Liberia, Liberian, Liberian government officials were representing Firestone to write this kind of kangaroo clause into the agreement. Arthur Barclay, Richard Henrys, and William V. S. Tottenham. The agreement was a huge victory for Firestone and its American affiliate, that is the Panas Corporation of America. Right after the signing of President King visited America, and he received a red carpet treatment and welcome. Then came 1927. In the 1927 elections, Firestone played a greater role to consume most of the issues debated by the candidates. Both President King of the Tory Party and Thomas J. R. Faulkner of the People's Party lauded for the Firestone Agreement as a success and victory for liberal economic recovery. But Faulkner later differed with the K clause in the agreement. Faulkner said, Yes, even though we are, we are competitors, we are fighting to be president, I'm on from my party, you are from my party. Yeah, we agree for Firestone to come, but that particular K clause there, I disagree. There was a burden, additional burden to the Liberian government. With all the criticisms in and out of the country about the Firestone Agreement and the election, the election resulted into a landslide victory for President King. The results of the election was recorded in the Guinness Book of Records as the most fraudulent election in world history. According to the Election Commission at that time, only about 150,000 citizens, mostly American Liberians, were constitutionally eligible to register and vote. However, the official election result posted by the Election Commission showed that President King won 240,000. That is, 240,000 citizens voted in favor of President Charles Dunbar Burgess King. 150,000 people registered. But the results say the man won 240,000. So where the other people coming from? But you know what happened? The ruling party, the true party, they accepted the result. 
and dance in the streets of Morovia and hell onto power. You see, class in our country, nothing has really changed. The issue of foreign elections is something that we have to watch. The next thing in the administration of CDB King that is worth discussion is the Michael Garvey issue. As I was saying, the next issue that is worth discussion in the King administration has to do with the Marcus Garvey issue. The Firestone offered to Liberia was opposed by another group called the Universal Negro Improvement Association or UNIA. And that group was headed by Mr. Marcus Garvey. This was a vocal group that wanted to establish a place for blacks suffering racial discrimination in America. The UNIA, that is Universal Negro Improvement Association, headed by Marcus Garvey. They were looking for a place to establish in Africa here, mostly near Liberia or in Liberia, for a group of black people that were suffering from discrimination in America. Marcus Garvey came to Liberia not only to find a place for his people, but also to help the Liberian government because he had heard about the Firestone Agreement. And so he came to help the government to build schools, to build hospitals, to build roads, or in short, to modernize Liberia. The UNRA, that is the Universal Negro Improvement Association, also promised to loan the Liberian government $5 million for development and to improve agricultural production. President King then listened to Michael Garvey. Some of them partially agree with him. Some of them fully agree with him. And so when President King visited America, the UNIA, that is the Universal Negro Improvement Association, under the leadership of Marcus Garvey, welcomed him and wished him, that, wished him well that he had fruitful talks with the American government. But before that historic visit by the president, Many prominent Liberians, including former and present government officials, were registered members of that pressure group, the Universal Negro Improvement Association. It's just like the time when Gabriel Bacchus Matthews and the Power Group came to Liberia. A lot of people registered. Even today, some of our present government officials who are parading the streets of Monrovia, the Parisian this, Parisian that, they were all members of, 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 of Power. I said, you, you, you know some of them, you gave us time, we list them. Most of them, yeah, Obama here today. And so pressure people coming to the country and people joining, it was not a bad thing. And so when you look at the history, some of the people that joined Michael Gary were permanent Liberian, including former government officials. They all registered with the pressure group. Among them were two ex-presidents, Arthur Barclay and Daniel E. Howard. The UNIA was opposed by the Americans, and Americans classified them as troublemakers who wanted to divide the blacks with their socialist ideas. Uh -huh. So you see, anytime somebody come out and it is not in the interest of those people, they classify you as a, so a socialist, somebody with socialist ideas. Despite the exchange of communication with the UNI and the government of Liberia, who wanted to support the movement on her hand, Marcus Garvey and his group was thrown out with the help of our friends, our friends from America, through the U.S. Special Envoy, Daryl E. B. Du Bois. Marcus Garvey, on the other hand, had expressed his disgust with the King's administration. Because when Michael Garvey came to like, because some of the government officials were doing business on the hand with Michael Garvey. But then when they saw that Uncle Sam did not agree for Michael Garvey to hold ground in Liberia here, they started to draw back. And of course, the ambassador here insisted that the Liberian government should not do any business with Michael Garvey. Following the 1927 fraudulent election results, Thomas Faulkner became a leading voice against the King administration. He built on the complaints of forced labor lodged by Chief Zebo, Chief Jay, and elders of Widabo, Plebo, Plan in Maryland County. Even missionaries in Liberia at that time added their confirmation to the allegation. 
As you know, the missionaries were people who were all in the interior, the, the, the Pentecostal Royal Alliance, the Methodists, the Catholics, the uh, Baptist missionaries were all. So anything happening in the country, the missionaries were low because they go in the villages and interior, in the interior part of the country. President King appealed to the League of Nations for an investigation. Fortnite lodged this complaint to the League of Nations. President King said, well, your career can't investigate. That is what I've been saying there is not true. The League of Nations appointed three main delegations to conduct the investigations. They, an Englishman, Dr. Kubert Christie, an American sociologist from the Fisk University, and former President Arthur Barclay, also serving on that team, that investigation team for the financial crisis, was the secretary, Professor P.G. Wallow of the University of Liberia. In 1930, the report, which was called the Christian Report, noted that slavery, as defined by the Anti Slavery Convention, did not exist in Liberia, and that the government did not participate and encourage slavery. However, the report also said it noted that the government engaged in methods consistent with forced labor and the practice of sending in indigenous people to Gabon and Fernandepo as laborers was consistent with slavery because of the compulsory method or the compulsory nature of recruitment. In other words, the Christian report say the King administration did not sell human beings like a commodity. But what they did was they recruited people forcefully, whether you agree or not, they force you and you go to Fernandepo and the people who were doing business at Fernandepo were giving them kickbacks. After the commission's report and realizing the disgrace and subsequent embarrassment looming on Liberia, the Liberian House of Representatives convened a proceeding to impeach President King. However, at the advice of his lawyer and his cousin, Senator William V. S. Tuckman, President King and his vice president, his vice president, Ali Yancey, resigned. And so those who sat along with him as vice presidents were Samuel Afre Ross, Henry T. Wesley, and Ali Yancey. Thanks for listening to this topic and the program or the lesson on the administration and achievement of President Charles Domba Project King who served as president of Liberia from 1920 to 1930. If you have any concerns or questions, please text to this number, 086-573-114. And of course, you have been listening to Teaching by Radio, program sponsored by the Ministry of Education and Partners for COVID-19. But before you leave, please follow the questions and try to provide some answers. One, describe the economic condition at the time President C.D.B. King took power as president. Two, describe and analyze the economic condition of Liberia before the arrival of Firestone. Your presenter and teacher for today's lesson is J. Emmanuel Milton. Amen. Amen. Amen.